is it saying it's recording? I don't see anything telling me it's, there we go. For the sake of recording, I'll say welcome everyone to meeting number two of the Hillcrest Sustainability Workgroup. Um, we are gonna dive into Lead for Communities Platinum certification and the stuff in the lead scorecard that this group indicated they wanted to spend more time talking about. Um, and I think we're gonna start off with our icebreaker, uh, which was also your homework. Uh, and over the course of time at the Port Authority, we've uh, developed an approach with our design teams to achieve some of these sustainable design, uh, sustainable development outcomes, which I've talked to these design teams about as, as bookending. You know, it's pretty easy for a, a design team, an engineer, an architect, a landscape architect, whatever, to figure out what they have to design and what criteria they have to hit to get a permit and to be able to go build a thing. But not too often are they asked, What's the other bookend? What is the most regenerative, most sustainable, most equitable thing you could design? Um, and it really frees up the minds, in my experience, of uh, of designers to think out of the box and to get out of that, I've got to get this permit or I've got to get this thing done, this deliverable for this client, and allows them to be a little creative. So that's the kind of creativity we wanted to try to draw out of all of, all of you folks um, by asking you for to think about what that bookend is. Um, you know, oftentimes those bookends aren't achievable, practical, financeable, et cetera. Um, but then we take a step or two back until we get to the thing that can actually get done and built. Um, but you don't really know how far you can go until you've pushed <laughs> uh, as far as you can push, right? So with that said, um, this is an example, uh, I think either from Becky or Tiffany um, of a project in Copenhagen. Um, this is a multifunction uh project it is a parking ramp it is a ski hill in the winter it's a mountain biking course in the summer um it is a uh waste energy plant uh which is why there's smoke coming out of that thing so obviously not all of these uh most sustainable coolest resilient thing we can think of are going to be practical particularly at hillcrest but uh just to get the juices flowing we wanted to to go there um, so some of you sent in uh, homework being examples of things you want, uh, you think are out there, um, and some of you may not have. So if you haven't, um, to, uh, that Chelsea, that is real. <laughs> yep. um, and uh, so we'll start off, I guess, by going through the stuff that was sent in and people could talk uh, a little bit about uh, why they were we're drawn to that concept. Um, and if you haven't done that yet, spend some time Googling now and paste a link in the chat or uh, an image uh, to help us think about what your uh, coolest sustainable resilient thing that you've come across is. Uh, so with that said, um, somebody sent in smart streetlights. Is whoever sent that in on the call? That was me. What were you thinking about smart streetlights, Keely? Um, yeah, that one came up when I was just um, researching different sustainability methods. And I liked it because it's not something that I think people think about often when it comes to pollution. People don't think about light pollution. I definitely don't living in the city until I go back home or until I go back to visit family um, in rural South Dakota. And I realize how much of the night sky that we're missing. Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely something that I just isn't, I think isn't on the forefront of a lot of people's minds and something I'd like to see um, targeted in the future. I think the solutions to it are like really easy and um, easily practiced, I guess. Things like um, smart sensor street lights that only turn on um, like when cars or people are walking or something like that. Um, also switching to um, more efficient bulbs with like targeted light um, was a big one that came up in my reading. Um, so yeah, these are all practical things that help um, both humans and our like animal communities. I know light pollution affects everything from um, aquatic animals to birds and insects. So yeah. I've got a 
funny slash cool story for you and a lead credit for you. Uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson was a keynote speaker at the U.S. Green Building Conference, I don't know, three, four years ago. Uh, and he wrapped up his speech. He got done. I mean, people were freaking out. He did a great job. But then he started freestyling. He's like, let me throw up these other slides. I've never done these before. And he had taken photos out of an airplane flying at night into New York City, Boston, and Chicago. And he uh, actually maybe it was just Boston and Chicago. And he said, look at this. And the downtowns were completely dark. And the only thing you could see for lights was these fingers of residential and and thoroughfare roads with the street lights everywhere. I mean, just like this sprawling spider web. Um, but it was really interesting that for a guy who thinks about astronomy and the stars and how easy it is to see the, see the stars via light pollution, um, he was really focused on these street lights and the fact that they were really messing up his world. Um, the lead credit is there is a lead credit uh, that we uh, have to work with the city on to figure out to get the right kind of street lights because there is a standard for uh, glow. What is it called? I'm going to space it here. There's low glare and I think sky glow. Night, night, night sky. You got to meet the night sky standard, which is a, a light sky pollution sky. standard. Yes. yes, there you go. Thank you. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, who put up a sensible mix of technologies? Thank you, Keely. Did somebody send in homework about a sensible mix of technologies? Yeah, I, I want to say that at, we're looking at John for that one. It's the timber. Uh, I was going to say there. you're muted, John. If you're, I was going to say that's got to be John. Yes, um, <laughs> I see. I, the number one thing I see in this building, other than uh, the beauty of wood, it is an amazing material. Um, is it is the ultimate pent ultimate carbon sink. Um, there was I don't know if you guys saw there was recently a, a study released about all of the carbon capture. There's a plethora of ideas that have been out there and people working on it and hundreds of them and only a couple of them are net energy positive uh and it seems like kind of crazy to to uh have to try to with machines capture car, car carbon when we have these wonderful biological machines which do it very quickly and uh when they're done capturing it it's not just something stored in limestone you know a thousand feet underground it's these materials which we can make into almost anything. So it's uh, back to the future. Um, <laughs> and and uh, it's, I don't know, I, I, I think it's going to be really big again. Because <laughs> we kind of, yeah, with concrete and steel. And, and the, the new factory that I'm planning, I'm even looking at wood floors, uh, fully capable of handling forklifts. And uh, there's a couple species of wood that are can handle it just fine. The weight of a forklift, twisting and turning and all that kind of stuff. And there's companies that make these floors uh, and there's really no reason not to do it. Um, and when your building is lighter, it sinks slower. Your foundations can be less of a foundation underneath, less site preparation, all kinds of things. It's less, a win, win, less, con win, less win. concrete. Less concrete, a lot less concrete. Less embodied, yeah. less embodied carbon. It's a lot of embodied carbon. Yeah, and and look look at what was done with wood. If you've ever been out west and seen some of the railroad bridges that span canyons that were built in the late eighteen hundreds and in, into the uh, 20th century, completely out of wood supporting trains, which weigh hundreds and hundreds of tons, moving at speed on a curve. I mean, it's insane when you do the math at how much force is. And uh, so uh, a measly 10,000 pound forklift driving around, no big deal. So uh, we're just, we're in a renaissance again. <laughs> Another renaissance. Just, I love it. Let's uh, let's move on. Uh, yeah. Somebody sent in a comment about wind and solar power. Uh, 
Oh, sorry. I think that's me, Rebecca. Hey, Rebecca. Hi there. Yeah. <laughs> um, I um, just as alternatives to um, or to other fuel sources, I um, a friend of mine is really, you know, obviously has his own company, um, but um, has really encouraged or taught me a lot about wind power and solar power, solar power especially, and he just gets so excited about it um, in talking. And um, so in turn, that's that's kind of what I'm into also. <laughs> so Are pretty we, much uh, what I have to say about it. <laughs> We're super jazzed about solar, and I think you've heard us say we, we think we need to deploy about 12 to 14 megawatts of rooftop and ground-mounted solar out here. Um, so I, I anticipate there being solar panels everywhere. Uh, I anticipate it being a requirement of all buyers. Uh, and uh, if you see, I, I think Vomella now over on Payne, or excuse me, Arcade and Phelan, uh, right. 1.3 megawatts, that's gotta be the largest rooftop in the state, Russ, certainly in the metro. Um, and that was a business owner making a business decision to do the right thing for the climate uh, and his brand, uh, but also uh, to offset the production costs of the equipment they use. Um, so it's kind of a no-brainer. Um, so definitely wind, uh, solar, wind, obviously large-scale wind turbines can be a little difficult in the urban areas, um, but there are more compact vertical turbines and uh, people are thinking up new ways to utilize wind energy in the urban areas all the time. Seen some pretty cool prototypes that maybe we'll get around to looking at here. Um, somebody sent in the comment, my bike plus my neighbors plus public transit equals car free. <clears throat> Chelsea, is that, are you, I think you might be muted. Actually, you're not say you're muted. your sound settings might be uh, adjusted for a different video format. If you've been Microphone. switching between Teams and Zoom anytime recently, it might do that to your computer. Still not working. Maybe while Chelsea's um, trying to fix the technology, we also had a couple of other folks who um, mentioned bikes. So is this Matt? And then it looks like Russ also had a an image of some bikes in the chat. Do either of you want to chime in? I can jump in. That's a picture also from Copenhagen, and I had a chance to be there a few years ago. And um, that image is not of an event. That's that's just a daily commute. It's um, just a day. Monday. <laughs> just a day. Just Monday. Right. Exactly. Um, and Copenhagen is certainly not a um, a cold climate city in the same way that we are, but they're not a warm climate city either. And people um, figure out how to move around on bikes. I mean, certainly not everyone, but it's like 60% commute share there. And of course, a much denser place than we are. But um, but rather than thinking of it as, oh, they're just old Europe and dense and that makes it easy. It actually has been a 45 year project to make this possible there and done incrementally over time. And so I just think about that story, which is that it takes time to sort of rethink and reimagine the way that our built infrastructure works for us. But every piece that we build or rebuild like we're doing at Hillcrest is an important component of making futures like this possible. So. That's my two cents. Good point, Russ. And I know the city's bike plan and the investments that the city's been making in uh, in bike accessibility is pretty uh, pretty important and has been going strong for a few years here now. And only got a few more decades to go to make it right. <laughs> That's right. This photo is reminding me of a study abroad I did in Holland when I almost smashed into an entire family on one bike. It was a dad and three daughters of various sizes, and he definitely knew I was American because he calmly said in English, you have to stay to the right. 
(laughs) (laughs) And wherever he was going, he had the whole posse with him and everybody seemed warm and happy. (laughs) Matt, did you want to chime in too? Sure, sure. Yeah. Um, I guess just just what really struck me about the article is not just the um, not just the the great sustainability sustainability impacts from this, but um, just how I guess uh, just the the safety impacts that they talk about, just how easy it is to to get around without having to worry um, about either you know slipping off the road or being hit by a car. Um, I uh, I try to bike to work whatever I can, um, even in uh, cold weather like like we're having, but um, the way my neighborhood is situated, there's not really a good way to get anywhere to the west because um, Maryland and, and White Bear are both um, extremely dangerous to bike on and they're the only streets that are really plowed. So um, if you can get to a trail and you're fine, but we really don't have some of those connections. Um, and it's, it's just something really, really good to keep in mind. Um, I've been hit by a car before uh, trying to get to a trail. So it's really, uh, I think it's just really good to keep in mind that as, as Russ said, it takes a long time to to build this stuff up, but um, the the sooner we can kind of get into that paradigm of of putting that safety as a priority, the the better off people will be as we um, continue to improve it. Yeah, and I'm sad that it looks like Chelsea had to drop off. Hopefully, she'll be able to reconnect because I this is I think a picture of her bike in the winter here and how important <laughs> the trail connections are plus having the network of um, people who can support you if you do need a car for a longer journey and then public transit for other local trips. Uh, Geothermal snow melt system. Yeah, um, so uh, I know Yanni, uh, a lot of places um, uh, other than here, uh, use will utilize uh, your geothermal system uh, before or spur of uh, the well um, for the the property itself to span the sidewalk uh, and parking lot area. So that way, you're we're not using salt. We're not using any kind of um, anything petro to move the snow, and it's um, an automatic uh, uh, snow deterrent. Uh, and then we're also, of course, getting our our building heated at the 48, 52 degrees. Um, and uh, the the ROI on this type of system is even uh, tends to be a little sooner than even solar or wind, um, unless you're doing a large wind project. Um, but I, just to step back to the to the bike thing. Um, the uh, it wouldn't be bad to uh, uh, possibly t- uh, if there's any kind of rapid bus system to either butt into the gold line when that's it once that's in, or um, to a direct connect to downtown train system. But uh, that's that's an MTC thing, um, and and then also uh, on the bike uh, situation. Are we going to do? Uh, is are, are we going to request a, a SWAT or do a SWAT of, say, like Larpenter, Maryland, White Bear, McKnight, with the added traffic? Uh, is that a traffic engineering question? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, the, there have been a bunch of city and county traffic engineers uh, for a couple of years looking at this now on what's called the technical advisory committee mm-hmm. uh, that went into the master plan, and so. I'm not sure how far out their uh, their analysis has gone, um, but I'm sure I could find that stuff and point you in the right direction uh, to see if it is what you were looking yeah, for, or if it's yeah, sufficient in your mind or not sufficient in your mind. No, I would, I would appreciate that. Yeah. Okay. So back, so back to this, the geothermal, and I don't know if um, it would be feasible to ask for every building to have have this done, but at least you know the mixed use. Um, and the higher the you know, the apartment complexes with office space, however however that design ends up being, um, and uh, because it, it's going to reduce uh, traffic and um, uh, as far as you know needing to clean the space and having to move cars to get them 
get the space cleaned. Um, and then where the town square is, I don't know if we've if if underground parking has been discussed for um, out of out of the community traffic to park instead of allocating tarmac. Um, but so that's all I have on the geothermal. <laughs> You know, uh, in that node, the neighborhood node, there is intended to be some sort of public amenity gathering plaza type oh. space. Uh, and that would be a great opportunity to do something like this and make it that much more usable year round and easier to maintain. Um, you know, free thermal energy uh, makes these things uh, make a lot more sense uh, than mm -hmm. having to burn coal or burn oil and gas to do it. Right, right. Well, thank you for that, Yanni. Uh, varied electrical service. I think that the the last two are some other suggestions that have been by folks who oh. have already had a chance to chime in, but wanted okay. to make sure we could hear from Mike as well. Um, put a couple of links in the chat. Sure. Uh, so the, uh, the the first link I put up was for uh, Cooperative Energy Futures. Um, what I really love about them is that they're a cooperative group with a, a bunch of different investors who have a, a system of um, essentially uh, providing the upfront costs of getting solar panels put up on buildings that are large enough to um, to host the solar gardens. And um, they prioritize and people who are uh, get into the subscription of getting access to the energy. Uh, they prioritize lower income um, families and uh, people and residents, uh, people who oftentimes get overlooked by um, uh, solar garden initiatives and stuff. The um, I wasn't quite sure what the uh, the financing was or what the uh, the scope for the solar gardens or um, the solar panels for the buildings on here was. But if if financing is an issue at all, um, I think Cooperative Energy Futures is a fantastic um, way to get solar panels on, um, but with mitigating the costs. They do have a um, uh, um, a thing where that the, they have contracts. I think it's on a 20 years at a time. So some some buildings that they try to get solar panels on um, resist uh, having a building exist for 20 years. They're like, well, maybe we'll bulldoze this building in a couple of years or something like that. But I would hope that the uh, the buildings being set up on the Hillcrest site would not be bulldozed in a few years. So you know. <laughs> um, and the uh, the other one is and, and based on the homework assignment, I wasn't quite sure if that counted as an initiative or not. But the other one is a um, uh, an initiative that uh, I've been trying to get going for a while to get solar panels put up on the St. Paul Public Schools. Um, both for uh, there, there are a number of different rooftops on the uh, St. Paul Public Schools that are large enough to host solar gardens, and with options that can provide the upfront costs, it's been a bit bewildering. Um, the some of the resistance to actually get work done on this and get it going. Um, oftentimes, the excuse is, "Well, we'd love to get this done, but we want to own the panels," and that's great if they do it, but it usually ends up being just an excuse to not do anything given that they'd only ever do it once St. Paul Public Schools have this big glut of um, money, which they're never going to have. But get, so given that there are both grants out there for uh, people to get uh, solar panels done um, in recent times, and that the fact there are options like corporate energy futures, it's it's a lot more, it's kind of more um, doable and much more, uh, I don't know, long-term profitable than it's ever been. So it's, you know, these are, these are initiatives that I'm um, keen on. You know, uh, Becky, can you click back on that cooperative energy future slide? Sure. Uh, or tab. Um, so I, I do know cooperative energy futures and have known of them and their model for a number of years. Uh, I've met with Tim uh, from CEP over the years. Um, and I think it's really interesting and, and very accurate where it says at the bottom cooperative energy futures does things differently because they really do have this social justice approach to solar and renewable energy deployment. Um, it's important to note that not all community solar gardens are equal, right? Uh, actually, yep. most of them, uh, Cooperative Energy Futures is in fact one of the few where uh, a community solar garden is actually owned by the members of the community. Most of them, in fact, wind up being sold and resold into some equity firm uh, and you're, uh, the community can subscribe to them, but that is different than ownership. And CEP has figured this out over the years. Um, I was talking to Tim years ago when they hadn't done they hadn't been able to do one yet, and now he's got several of them uh, completed. So uh, great idea and something we're thinking about, but we're also trying to make sure that when to educate people along the way that just because it's called a community solar garden 
doesn't necessarily imply all of the great benefits that folks like uh, that these guys have, have figured out their model. That's right. Yep. I see all that right. Chelsea's, Chelsea's back. back. Do you want to try chiming in again? And then Chelsea, we did talk um, through a couple people had bike related ideas. I didn't know if maybe you wanted to touch on some of the more high level concepts that are shown on this slide or bikes, whichever you'd like. Oh, still can't hear you. Oh, bummer. Now your video is frozen here as well, Chelsea. Well, let's keep moving. And she might hop out and hop back in or reboot or something. Um, did we get through the list on the other slide there, Becky? Yep, I think that was everybody. So I think um, there there were a couple of these. Those were a little bit more focused on specific technologies or strategies and some of the concepts on this page. Bioregionalism, energy democracy, and multifunctionality are a little bit more big picture concepts that'll be helpful to keep in mind as we talk through um, specific strategies, but and just the overall approach. So thanks to everybody who submitted those ideas as well. Monty, I wonder if you wanted to. Um, we had wanted to spend a couple of minutes up front oh. on something else that the port wanted the, to bring up. The announcement, yes. Mm -hmm. um, you guys may know, you may have been noticed or not, but next Friday, uh, 8.30 a.m. to 11 a.m., sometime in that window, is a planning commission public hearing on the master plan, um, which is uh, a great time to provide your input. Uh, many in this group and uh, around the community have said, how do we help? How do we help make all this good stuff happen and, and help make this a carbon free community? Uh, supporting the master plan and moving the project forward, that would be a great way to support it. Uh, we do know, you know, for 18 months or so, there have been some other ideas uh, out there uh from a uh, group or groups of other folks um and just know we're well aware of them um you may have been contacted by other groups about other plans or alternate ideas and uh just so you know uh we're happy to answer any questions you may have um at times we found some of the information out there on these alternate plans to be either not accurate or really not feasible for a variety of uh, engineering design and and uh, feasibility reasons. So I uh, just want to let everyone know there is a public hearing next Friday at 8.30 in the morning, um, and we'd be happy to uh, have any or all of you there uh, voicing your support for moving Hillcrest forward uh, such that we can start to build this carbon-free community. And if you have any questions about anything else you're hearing out there, uh, feel free to reach out. Um, I'll give you my cell number, uh, and actually, if you have questions, you could reach out to me directly. Um, if you shoot me a text first, I might not recognize your number, so shoot me a text first, and then I'll know who it is and pick up the phone. 651-338-1039. Uh, Thank you. That's the first. There will be a second uh, City Council public hearing in like April-ish uh, before the City Council considers it in May. But that's the next sort of step forward. Uh, if that doesn't keep moving, uh, if the master plan doesn't keep moving, much of the momentum and the initiatives and the financing that is starting to come together really start. We got to we got to build the snowball and keep it rolling here, guys. All right, um, moving on. OK, the the meat of today and we're now we're down to under an hour, so I'm going to be quick in my little part here. Um, this is an image of the star democracy. That's a new one. I think I just coined that. The star democracy we tried last time. Um, and those stars, of course, were the credits that you folks were particularly interested in. Just a reminder that Lead for Communities is this framework. So we all have the same language and the same metrics or some language, same language and metrics. Um, we've prioritized what we're going to talk about today based on your feedback. Um, some of these are very clear cut and have a very clear path forward. Some of them have much more room for development and input and co-creation, um, like, for example, uh, resilience planning um, for the site, which there wasn't a lot of stars or even any stars by resilience planning. So there's a slide about resilience planning later. Um, 
and just uh, you know, be engaged, uh, type, uh, raise your hand, type stuff in the chat, shout out if you hear something you like or want to dive into or you think is ridiculous along the way. Becky? Um, so these next like eight slides or something, these are the categories that folks didn't really star, you weren't really interested in. I'm going to blow through them about a minute each, and then we're going to get to the ones you just, but just so everyone knows what they are, what's in these categories, and then we'll get to the ones that you guys had starred. So one of the prerequisites in Lead for Communities is an integrated process, uh, meaning that you have to have an integrated design team, you have to have multi disciplines, you have to have regulators and different scientists and engineers and designers all working together to create the plan. Uh, and that we certainly have done uh, in conjunction with the city for the last two years. Uh, there's a there's a credit in there about green building policies and incentives. And one of the ways we're uh, trying to get that point is by requiring all buildings to be LEED or green community certified. Next slide, Becky. Um, this, I can't remember if this group has seen this or not. These are just coming hot off the press and will be going out via some press stuff uh, over the next couple of weeks here. Um, and this is a rendering of what the wetland could look like. This is Hillcrest. Uh, this is a rendering that uh, Tiffany and the team at LHB put together. Uh, and this is one way the boardwalk uh, treatment could be added to the, the restored wetlands. Um, and you see the industrial buildings in the back with the uh, the arts and employment district concept being these big murals on them. You see some ground mounted solar off to the left there. Um, there's about a half a dozen of these showing different parts of the site that are, like I said, just hot off the press and we'll be delivering them publicly over the next couple of weeks here. Um, but you guys are getting a sneak preview. Um, pretty cool amenity. Uh, so the natural systems and ecology uh, category includes a credit for ecosystem assessment, which is complete, a construction activity pollution prevention plan, which is underway. There's a green space requirement uh, to get this particular point in lead for communities. You would have to uh, have eight acres of green space. We're doing 20 acres of green space. Uh, this is the light pollution reduction credit, uh, street light glare, sky glow minimization. Uh, there also there's a separate credit that talks about the energy efficiency of the lights, uh, and that's the one we're working uh, with the city and Excel Energy on. Um, natural resources conservation and restoration. Um, it's interesting to note that, you know, the, the ecosystem services at this site, being the wetlands, the soil, the trees, have really all been degraded by the contamination and the wetlands to some degree by their lack of maintenance or care over the years. Um, so uh, even more so than a conservation project, this project really entails the remediation and the restoration of those ecosystem services you know, uh, there's only one of what 11 wetlands out here that's high quality. The rest of them are like plant managed class C, uh, so they're pretty degraded um, and they also do have this mercury in their sediment uh, in the wetlands. So we do need to re remediate and restore the ecosystem services rather than just conserving a natural resource. Uh, we got to fix it first. Uh, and a resilience plan that is also in this category. Uh, and that is something we would love to have folks weigh in on. Uh, to get that point, we've said we will do a resilience plan. The city has their climate action and resilience plan. There's a county document. I think those are referenced here below. Um, there's a couple of rating systems that we pulled some ideas out of. Um, so a resilience plan could include a vulnerability and capacity assessment, uh, looking at what are the top hazards and how do we mitigate them. Um, a resilience plan itself uh, could include things like a resilience hub. Uh, emergency shelter, kitchen space, community tool share. Um, you know, I think of this one as uh, what happens when you know things go to hell in a handbasket. You know, how do you get the how do you get the felled oak out of your driveway when after a tornado if you don't own a chainsaw? You know, uh, what do you do in the case of extreme drought, extreme storms, etc.? Um, the resilience plan could talk about things like hardening roof systems, uh, green infrastructure. Um, and there's a multitude of resources here. Uh, there is a rating system kind of like LEED called RELI, R-E-L-I, uh, which is a national internationally based uh, set of ideas, a framework about what are what are some smart resilience things to do. Um, let's go, I see two hands up. Uh, Keely, what? Uh... Yeah, I just had a couple of questions about the previous slide. Um, 
first was just for the lead credit um you said you needed at least eight acres but is that like per 50 acres or how does that work it is it is a calculation and when you do that calculation for this site the number is eight acres um and we have committed on the front end when we acquired the site to produce 20. gotcha and then the second question was just related to um like the wetlands and conserving um, old growth trees specifically. I, I haven't actually like walked the site or anything. I've just driven by, but I've heard that a lot of the old growth trees are by the wetlands. So are those able to be preserved or is it hard to like do some of the cleanup with those trees? It, it is. We, we, there has been a tree inventory. Uh, the city's consultant and our consultant both did tree inventories. We've identified the high value trees uh, like the ones you're talking about, and we are committed to doing our best to preserving them. Uh, Tiffany's speaking with a company right now that's uh, looking at our ability to pick up some of the more valuable ones and either relocate them on site or move them off site. Um, it, it's going to be a little tricky because the root balls themselves will be filled with soil that has mercury in it. So there's an environmental liability associated with then moving them off site or even relocating them on site. <laughs> So it is going to be tricky, but we have heard a lot about preserving trees. Uh, we will do our best. And at the end of the day, the Pollution Control Agency tells us when we can stop digging, when we can stop cleaning. We have to sample all the soil while we're digging. And once it's clean, we can stop. Um, so there will be quite a few trees that are lost, um, but we are committed to doing the best we can uh, with the conditions out there. Great, thanks for answering. Yeah, I think just from like a climate standpoint too, as many um, yeah. old growth yeah. trees that we can preserve makes a difference. Trees are amazing, amazing inventions. That is for sure. Um, Iani. Yes, um, so uh, on the wetlands, uh, it's my understanding that uh, there's only one that we can actually keep as is and the rest need to be restored. And then how many, uh, what's the plan on how many we're restoring to? It's not the same. Is it? It's not the same number as what we have currently, correct? Tiffany, I think, is our resident expert, and I think the answer is one to one. Yes. So we have to, to we have to mitigate and on site at a one to one ratio, or the watershed will not give us a permit. Yes. Okay. And right. actually, there is an additional requirement to do a two to one uh, mitigation or per credit purchase for um, the WACA compliance. So mm. for every acre of wetland that needs to be cleaned up and moved elsewhere, we have to count that one on site and then buy credits for a second acre off site to um, complete our WACA compliance. So there's 5.6 acres of wetland on the site. And when it's all said and done, there will be 5.6 acres of wetland on the site and they will be free of okay. mercury. Oh, outstanding. Okay, because I I had heard different, and thank you. <laughs> so okay. they will be yes, they will, they will be free of mercury, and they will be functioning ecologically as uh, God intended. No, just that we we're doing one to one. I, I I it sounded like that we were going to lose some in, in one of the plans. Something I read, and, and not not. There there were other iterations, uh, but the the final master plan includes enough space for one to one. Sure, good. All right, thank you. Uh, let's go, Chelsea, and then Russ. Oh, nothing. Maybe in the chat, Chelsea. Do you want to type your, your comment, Chelsea? Don't have access to the chat. You can also feel free to email yeah. Tiffany, especially would probably be a good person, and me and Monty, and we can communicate. Yeah. Why don't you Sorry, send, it's not working for you. Why don't you send an email while Russ uh, comments here? Sure, thanks. Um. As much as this project overall can be restorative uh, in some ways, in other ways it will also, it has the potential to increase urban heat island relative to the current condition. And so I think that's, I think that's just an important concept in thinking about this area of resilience um, and, the, and the things that we should be thinking about mitigating for as hotter summers are going to are going to be 
probably at the top of that list if 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 not close to it um and so just thinking about the 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 site itself and its contribution overall to the urban heat island gotcha uh let's tell me tell us when you get an email tiffany but otherwise let's keep moving here we've got a bunch more to get through uh, water efficiency. Uh, so integrated water management, there's a credit for that. Uh, the city has done a water availability assessment. Some of these are kind of a low bar because this same system applies in sub-Saharan Africa and China as it would here. Um, water access and quality, everyone's got to have clean water. Uh, and then we have a system in place in our state to do that. Uh, stormwater management is an interesting one here because we know there has been flooding issues in the past, uh, I believe south of the site, and we heard a lot about uh, concerns about the project contributing more to more flooding. And it, it's interesting to think about the fact that right now on the site, there really isn't uh, much of any modern stormwater management uh, tools. Uh, we literally just had to unplug a pipe that's probably been plugged for five or 10 years and has been overflowing the sidewalk and uh, causing a bunch of problems. Um, so, you know, this site will have to be permitted. Uh, the, the port has practiced what we call next generation stormwater management for almost 15 years now. Uh, and so we will bring best management practices and uh, all these hard surfaces, all these sites will have to deal with their own stormwater, their own rainwater that falls on them appropriately. So it net net, uh, building this site out should actually reduce the flood risk uh, to nearby neighbors than what it is today. Because once those soils get saturated, everything just sheet flows off and it's going somewhere um, and hopefully not in your basement. Um, smart water systems. Uh, the city does use smart water systems. Next one. Let's um, revisit Chelsea's question. Oh, um, Tiffany added it to the chat. What is the timeline for mercury mitigation and how would this mitigation relate to grading for the site? Is this a separate or later process? It, it is done in one exercise we call mass grading uh, and we anticipate mass grading starting, assuming we can secure all the funding, uh, we anticipate mass grading starting in August of this year and it will take an entire year. Uh, we've got to we've got to move about a half a million yards of dirt, um, and that is for grading, for roads, uh, for development, and for remediation and geotechnical, all all at once in one big swoop. Um, there is a materials and resources credit. Uh, there's a diversion required for the construction and demolition waste from infrastructure. Uh, the building developers uh, will also be that they're being required to be LEED certified. They'll have a, a diversion requirement. Uh, there's a solid waste management credit uh, that the city and county uh, programs uh, hit. Uh, Russ, I wasn't sure if I had this one right. Organic waste treatment. Is there a citywide organics collection program starting this year or maybe next year? Or did I dream that? Pilots this year, probably full implementation next year and it's it's Ramsey and Washington counties jointly offering that um, with upgrades happening out at Newport. Awesome. Is is swim club still a thing or did they disband swim club Russ? Uh, <laughs> that's technically still a thing. Yeah, I, I started my career uh, at the state working with something called the Solid Waste Management Coordinating Board, the swim club uh, group of metro uh, entities that deal with solid waste in the cities here. Um, recycling infrastructure, uh, also we qualify for this credit given what we do in St. Paul and responsible sourcing for infrastructure. We right now are pouring through the five most expensive infrastructure materials uh, like concrete, like dirt, like pavement. Um, and we have to require, I think it's something like 50% recycled content in those five most expensive materials. Does that sound right, Tiff? Something like that. 40%, okay. Um, let's keep rolling here. Uh, there's a quality of life category, uh, which requires a demographic assessment, uh, requires your looking at and identifying social infrastructure, uh, schools, hospitals, uh, parks, et cetera. Um, there's an economic growth credit, uh, which in this case we reach uh, by bringing jobs to the site, uh, attainable jobs with low barriers to entry, near affordable housing, uh, and the required job density we require on these sites. 
uh, affordable housing uh, will be uh, dealt with. You know, the master plan talks broadly about the city goals, working with the city, the county, uh, other partners as people compete for low income housing tax credit and financing. There will be affordable housing on site. We don't know how much or uh, at what levels of affordability, but we certainly have heard the need for deeply and permanently affordable housing. Uh, and those are the kinds of strategies that would get us credits in this uh, category, points in this credit. Uh, public health, uh, we have committed to uh, doing outdoor air quality monitoring and displaying outdoor air quality monitoring. Um, and the emergency management credit here really is about response time for emergency services, uh, which we uh, qualify for here in St. Paul. And this one, I'm just going to give a little overview of on this slide, and then Becky's going to talk because this is now the, the credits you guys really wanted to talk about. This is the ones with all the stars. So energy and greenhouse gas emissions, there's a that's the category. There's a credit for power access, reliability, and resiliency. There's a credit for energy and greenhouse gas emissions, where we've all spent a bunch of our time uh, for the last two years. Um, there's an energy efficiency credit, and this in particular here, it's talking about the energy efficiency of wastewater plants, uh, pumps, street lighting, the district energy system, the infrastructure energy efficiency. Um, lead for buildings that will be required. That's talking about building energy efficiency. This credit's really about the energy efficiency of the infrastructure. Uh, renewable energy, this credit uh, asks you to maximize on-site solar, which we believe we are doing. And grid harmonization is sort of that next step of improving our energy grid, and there's a point or points for that. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Becky. So we got through all the ones that you guys weren't interested in. Now let's talk about the stuff you wanted to talk about. Sorry about that. And I think that it's it's fine if we want to really dig in in more detail here and save the transportation and land use, which is the other category that there was a lot of interest in. We can always save that for next time. So don't feel like you need to hold back on asking questions or comments because you're worried about time for this. Cool. That's a um, great reminder, Becky. Thank you. So we introduced the last time the, the goal of being a carbon free community here. And so just wanted to have a little reminder of what the definition of that is for this community, which would be that each year after the community is fully developed, it offsets as much greenhouse gas as is emitted due to the activities taking place within its geographic boundaries. And that's a pretty important distinction, especially because there are different ways of looking at what those activities are. So lead for communities is only concerned with scopes one and two, meaning it's looking at the natural gas use, the electricity use, the travel that's happening within those 112 acres. And then if there were any waste or wastewater treatment happening within those 112 acres, which is not really being proposed at this time. So that's for the lead for communities calculation. We know, especially on that transportation side, that there's going to be a lot of transportation that this project can have some impact on um, where this site is just the origin or the destination of trips. So um, we our analysis also takes a look at that out of boundary transportation that'd be considered in scope three, as well as the waste and wastewater treatment that's happening outside of the community's boundaries. So with that in mind, you saw one version of this graph at the first meeting, but this is showing the scopes one and two, what LEED cares about in this um, kind of saturated colors, and then the scopes three in the lighter colors here. So you can see there's a pretty big difference, especially on the transportation side, which is this green. Um, this graph is showing a baseline, which is 2018 um, St. Paul, information in tons, uh, short tons in this case, of carbon dioxide equivalents per capita, which includes both residents and the working population. Um, so that baseline is 8.8 .8 if we're just looking at those scopes one and two, um, up to 9.0 if we account for solid waste management that's happening outside of the city's boundaries. When we get to business as usual, this is looking at what we would expect based on improved energy efficiency in buildings due to um, building energy codes having been updated since all of the buildings in St. Paul were built, included in that baseline. Um, in addition to changes in Excel Energy's grid mix, so here we're looking at the year 2030 
as a year that this community would be fully built out. So we include Excel's anticipated 2030 electric grid mix. So you can see this portion that's electricity has decreased dramatically both from efficiency and from cleaner energy. Whereas the natural gas portion has reduced by not quite as much due just to efficiency. And then on the transportation side, you can see there's just, you probably can't see, there's a, just a tiny little sliver that we've calculated as travel happening on the like mile or two of road that's actually within the 112 acres. Most of the tr travel is obviously happening outside of the community's boundaries. And so for the business as usual, we've modeled moderate EV electric vehicle adoption based on some projections of where the market is expected to be going without you know, additional support or EV charging infrastructure kind of beyond um, what would be happening anyway. So when we get to the design, we are looking at completely eliminating emissions from building energy use and doing that through switching to all electric, so eliminating those fossil fuels from um, natural gas or for heating through a district energy system and then meeting the electricity needs through on-site solar to the extent that we can. So that's why the orange is disappearing. That is all, of course, predicated on these buildings being very energy efficient so that we can meet those, those loads with um, renewables on-site. For the transportation, there's still just a tiny bar in the scopes in the scope one area. Um, of transportation happening on site, but we're proposing an increase in electric vehicle adoption and an additional reduction in vehicle miles traveled kind of per person or per job or per household due to other strategies like supporting car sharing or supporting um, live work proximity. And we'll, we'll talk about those low carbon transportation strategies when we dig into the transportation and land use credits because they it can get a little bit more specific there. And then some additional um, modest reduction, um, waste, solid waste reduction and diversion from landfills incineration. Are there any questions about the numbers before we dig further into these design strategies? Okay. And let's get into it. So there's a lot of interest in district energy and geothermal. So we wanted to share um, that the site is per pursuing district heating and cooling and aquifer thermal energy storage or ATIS is one of um, a couple of different geothermal exchange technologies that are currently being evaluated for the site. These systems work. It's basically a uh, um, using the aquifers deep underground as a thermal battery. So it stores heat in the summer to be used in the winter and vice versa. Buildings would connect to a low temperature water loop and use electric heat pumps for heating and cooling. So that's allowing any connected building to be fully electric, which is difficult to achieve otherwise in a cold climate like Minnesota. So ATIS systems are being used extensively in Europe and the first system in Minnesota is being pursued at the Tower Side Innovation District in Minneapolis. Any questions about that or Monty, did you want to jump in with any additional details? No, I think you did a great job. Um, I guess I have a, just a brief question. You said you were looking into it. Um, how far into it looking into it and or and or like what is your assessment so far about uh, uh, viability here? We have uh, we've had Evergreen Energy uh, under contract for uh, probably about a year now. Uh, they've done an initial feasibility assessment and then a follow up um, and have come back with uh, and they looked at a number of of different technologies and strategies uh, building by building geothermal versus district uh, versus a district system powered by a center central plant versus ATES um, and ATES came back on top for a couple of reasons. Uh, one being we can modularize it and we can put in these wells, uh, you know, a half dozen of these wells throughout the site while the site is built out. Uh, makes it a lot more cost efficient if you're not having to install all the infrastructure for every building on day one and then wait 
five to 10 years for all the buildings to show up and for people to start paying for it. Um, and it's also that small footprint of being able to have these wells around the site, and there's only a handful of them, uh, versus literally hundreds, if not thousands of wells uh, that would be littered all over the site if we took a more conventional approach. Um, we just don't have, there's too much programming need, too much land use need, uh, and not enough space to have a you know five or 10 acre well field, for example, to, to power this thing. Um, so the next step we have not pulled the trigger on, uh, there's an aquifer test that you need to do. It's about a hundred grand to drill this hole in the ground. Um, they did it over at tower side and Ken Smith from evergreen tells me he anticipates the results will be similarly positive because it's the same aquifer. Uh, but there's some, uh, thermal dynamics, fluid dynamics. They have to test to make sure that they can use the aquifer and basically keep the warm water in one part of it and keep the cooler water in the other part of it and access them when they need to. Um, so uh, we right now are really trying to figure out how to finance it. Um, and that's part of an ongoing discussion with the city, the Port Authority, District Energy, Energy slash Evergreen, Excel. Um, so we're we're trying to figure it out um, and running pretty hard at a couple of different options. Uh, some of that will be probably coming to light as the as we move forward post master plan. Um, we kind of got to get over that hurdle uh, and then we can really start sinking our teeth and getting people focused on these technologies. Right now, uh, we're starting to design uh, right of ways like road sections and we're making sure we're reserving enough room in the roadways that we could put these pipes in. Um, regardless of technology, we just got to make sure we've got a clear corridor uh, that's the right depth and the right width, et cetera. Um, so we're, we've instructed our engineering team to keep designing as if this thing's going in. And it's on myself and others to, and, and Russ, I'm pointing at you, I'm looking at you, Russ, to figure out how to finance it. Um, you know, frankly, it's, it, it shouldn't be that difficult. The Port Authority has issued revenue bonds since the 1980s to finance and operate uh, Energy Park Utility Company. Uh, so we already do this on a pretty regular basis. Um, it's just that timing of when do you have to have the capital to build it and when do the buildings show up to pay for it and how risky is it? Um, and how do you mitigate that risk? And that's a, that's a question that the city and the Port Authority have to answer yet. All right, cool, I, thank you. Uh, um, have you looked at actually uh, electric, um, or has it been discussed uh, electric production via this uh, district energy or, or geothermal? Like an actual small on-site power plant? Like with it, like with it using this thermal energy to like turn a turbine or something is exactly, that what exactly yeah i'm i'm not the right guy to ask my my sense is that uh this low temperature energy doesn't generate enough oomph uh to turn a turbine but i would not be the right guy to make that statement okay so that, that was my other question is yeah how deep is the field <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that would that would answer it. Right. Oh, these are like 500 foot deep wells. Okay, all right, that answers it. Yep. And Tiffany is also our residential uh, geologist, so in case you have other geology questions, I will shut up. <laughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yay. Yay. Uh, okay. Well, I have a, a quick question. Um, is this energy system? Um, something that the surrounding neighborhoods might be able to tap into event like not I'm sure not right away but down the line um, you know interestingly enough Maplewood has Maplewood's comp plan has rezoned the northeast quadrant of the intersection of Larpenter and McKnight so Kitty Corner from Hillcrest is in Maplewood and they view that being built out as a mixed-use development um, and having worked on the district energy system over energy park utility company uh, over the years, um, I can tell you these district energy systems want more load. It gets more cost effective, the more things are hooked up to it. So I think once we get this thing in, as development and redevelopment occurs around this area, um, people would certainly look at opportunities to expand it. Kind of hard to say until some of that stuff happens, um, but I think people would look at it as an opportunity, sure. And well, just can you to, say something? Oh, sorry. Um, just really quick about the the risk, if any, to the aquifer itself in terms of changing the temperature or some sort of rupture or using the water. 
what is what actually how is the aquifer used? So again, not my exact area of expertise, but uh, the Department of Health has to license this. Uh, and being it is the first deployment over at Towerside, my understanding is they have gotten comfortable with it and they either have or have they've sent a letter indicating they are willing and able to permit this system over at Towerside. Uh, my understanding is you're extracting the water uh, in a closed loop system and returning it at a fairly similar temperature. Um, and so I don't believe there's a huge that, that frankly that was kind of one of my first questions Chelsea was like well geez that's got to do something weird to the bugs that live 500 feet below ground and don't the bugs that live 200 feet below ground eat those bugs and don't the salamate you know I'm, I was going where you were going um, so we certainly as we get into uh, the feasibility of the system will have to answer all kinds of more questions like that better than I am doing right now um, but I, I do know it has been reviewed by the state and looks like they're going to be able to get it permitted over at Tower so. Russ, do you know anything different or otherwise? Well, your team may have more expertise than I, but I, I will share what I know. Uh, one, we looked at this pretty deeply at the at the uh, Highland Bridge site, at, at the Ford site, um, before not being able to move forward. And my understanding was that it, the an, a, an ATIS system like this can meet about 40% of the thermal energy load typically for what's needed uh, in terms of the buildings. And to your earlier question, um, Chelsea, about others being able to tie into it, it, it's not super cost effective for like a single family home because you'd have to you know, install a bunch of piping for a relatively small amount of energy need. Um, so the, the, the more dense and bigger energy need, the more it makes sense to extend piping to something that's nearby. Is sort of the easiest way to think about that, right? Um, and I, I don't, I don't believe there's any water actually being extracted at all from the aquifer. You, you said extraction. It's it's literally just a closed loop system using the temperature of the aquifer yeah. to to either heat water or cool water as it passes through. Yes. Um, and so the um, there, there's no actual interaction between what's in the pipes and the aquifer itself. It's no, it might make everybody feel better to know that there are no critters <laughs> 500 feet below the surface or 200 feet below the surface. And there's no like material that's going to be injected into the aquifer. It's not like a fracking process where you're trying to fill it like a jelly donut. It is approximately 51 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, a couple hundred feet below the surface consistently all the time, which is why it's always chilly in a cave, but not freezing cold in a cave. Um, it has a really nice consistent thermal profile so it's really trying to suck or use that 51 degree pool of water to heat something up to 51 degrees use a thermal exchanger to pump more than 51 degrees into a building and then send it back down at approximately the same temperature so you're cooling water off in the summer and heating it up in the winter not an injection well and not an extraction well and i think that's what the state had to figure out was well what is it then <laughs> yep. there will be no goo going anywhere <laughs> let's keep rolling here unless there are more questions oh you've got to do the all electric bullet yet i think john did you have a question on that, on that? um yes uh, well a, a comment um i'm wondering why the port authority uh feels the need to do this part of it. When I looked at the economics of um, putting in a well for a heat pump on my existing building here, it's really not that expensive. Um, uh, even to, to drill a deeper one, uh, if you think a little bit long-term, the problem is everybody thinks so short-term on everything. Um, I think it's great that you're you're doing this, but uh, I'm just saying if 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 it didn't happen or something, I just put in my own. And if you do the numbers, it works out really good, especially if you've got solar on your roof, you know. <laughs> and yeah. the greenhouses, they're, they're the the most advanced greenhouses now are pumping uh, thermal energy uh, into the ground all summer long and depending on the depth you put it at, you can get that energy to come up through your soil at about the same offset as uh, summer is to winter and vice versa. 
so that the heat energy comes back out when you need it with, without uh, uh, any heat pump. And there's a lot of people growing um, uh, fruit and many other things at this latitude with those uh, type of systems. So this is, an, this is an amazing system. I love it. But uh, I guess the Port Authority, and you can answer this, is just trying to um, lead the way on this and make it easier for businesses to, to adopt this. Is that it? Yeah. That, that is part of it. There are some economies of scale, I think, when Evergreen did the math uh, of doing it with one centralized system being operated versus multiples, as you can imagine, multiple heat pumps, multiple heat exchangers in every one of these buildings. Um, and there are also some financing benefits to it being a publicly owned utility. Um, state bonding, for example, uh, tax exempt bonds, uh, tax exempt revenue bonds. Um, so there are some financing tricks that uh, lead it to make sense for it to be a, a port authority or otherwise publicly owned utility. We may wind up right exactly where you're talking, John, if we can't get this done, if we can't get this over the finish line. We, you know, we all of the things we looked at, we shot for the moon again. That book ending process we started talking about today, and we'll 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 take a step back to a fallback position if we can't get this done. But we think right now, uh, some version of a district energy system is the most economical and carbon uh, reductive way to approach this on a site wide basis. Oh yeah, it, it's economies of scale works so well in favor of this. And uh, did you did you you said something that I want to be clear on? Are you is there going to be a central heat pump system, uh, or are we just going to get a connection to the to the aquifer for the heat pumps that we have in our buildings? There there will be maybe half a dozen, as it's been explained to me, large wet aquifer wells that we need mm -hmm. to, to co-locate next to some of the big industrial buildings. So those heat pumps are powered by the solar energy coming off that building. Um, and then there will be additional, there you go, bingo. So the big one that goes down to the, so there'll be some big ones and then there'll be distribution infrastructure that gets the uh, hot and cool water from building to building. But the idea would be, you would be provided just like an energy park, there are pipes coming into those buildings, mechanical rooms, and then what sits in that mechanical room looks different than if you were doing this with fossil fuels. Okay, so th this, okay, I've seen this on the military bases I've been on. Many of them had this, and of course in Russia, which I've spent a lot of time in, they have this central heating system uh, pumping hot water around the city. Uh, and it is, and the Russians did everything the most economical way you could imagine because of limited resources. So excellent. I, I had no idea. I'm even more excited about this project. <laughs> My gosh, I thought I was just going to get uh, the uh, 50 degree uh, temperature uh, glycol into my building and then, you know, uh, uh, have my own heat pumps. OK, great. Thank you. Yeah, so this is kind of leading to the the next slide, but I'll just go back for a second to mention that the district energy heating especially enables the site to move towards all electric by eliminating the need for those um, natural gas natural gas heating. So the idea is that natural gas service would be restricted to systems or devices for which an equivalent all electric system is either not available, not practical or cost effective or is determined to present an equity gap. So it seems like heating, water heating should all be able to be taken care of and and maybe if there's just a, a very specific industrial user on the site that um, might not be able to replace their um, natural gas equipment with electric at this time. Um, other than that, we're looking at all electric. And importantly, that electricity would need to be powered by clean energy sources in order to get to our carbon free goal. So the um, goal is to be provided by as much on site renewables as possible. So this is what this diagram is showing. Um, we already called out the ADA system where there um, are central pumps that are you know, doing that thermal exchange with the aquifer. This is showing those at the light industrial buildings, which are um, in gray here, and then distributing across the site. The residential mixed use buildings are in white. 
And then the energy balance is showing all of the rooftops maximized for rooftop solar, but because of the heights of the residential buildings um, and the uses, there is an ability to have excess production in the green bars at the industrial sites with those large, you know, one story rooftops. Um, and at the residential sites, it's the other way around where we can't quite get enough production to make this a net zero energy building by itself. So the concept here is not a collection of net zero energy buildings, but rather a net zero energy community that leverages the mixed uses in order to make that happen. And from our initial analysis, there's like just about enough room between all of the rooftops and some um, on site solar, whether it's some covered parking um, or other resources to get there um, by balancing out the excess on light industrial buildings with um, the, the residential buildings. So Monty mentioned about 14 megawatts is is what that early analysis showed a combination of rooftop and site based. Um, and then we wanted to talk a little bit about ownership models in order to both um, qualify for the lead credit and also to actually have an impact to accelerate renewable energy development in Minnesota beyond what otherwise would have occurred. It's important for the community, whether it's specific building owners or some other definition of community to own the renewable energy credits from um, this um, on site solar production so that it's not going towards statewide goals um, that would otherwise be met with renewable energy elsewhere. So that leads us to this question that um, has come up from I think community members and other stakeholders of what about community the idea of actual community solar as a concept. So I wanted to hand that one off to Monty. Well, I, there's there's two questions here. Um, you know, uh, one is about community solar and uh, and what are the aspects of it? Uh, is it the uh, wealth creation ownership community ownership you know uh justice approach to renewable energy deployment that people feel drawn to um because the the finance and the economics of it um you know it's it's not like you sign up to it and suddenly your energy bill gets cut in half um and so that's a question the other question down there in blue is as important because we're also hearing about this and and getting a little pushback from some corners well, it's really expensive to do all this on site. Why do you really need to do it on site? Let someone else build it more efficiently, more cheaply somewhere else, and you guys can just buy it. Um, and so what is it, you know, and our answer to that is we are right now trying to get uh, renewable energy partners, Michael Krauss and Jemez Staples Group. Uh, we're trying to get them under contract right now to help us develop a workforce training program out here for local resident recruitment, uh, not just for right now, they're doing solar certification training over in North Minneapolis. We want to get in the EV stuff, which they're trying to develop programs for. We have a district energy technology here that folks could get trained in that no one else apparently uh, knows how to do. Um, and so our answer is we think it's important to deploy all this solar on site because of the workforce development component that we believe should be married with this deployment of these solar resources. Um, but what do you folks think? You guys think about this stuff, I think, a lot. And so either one of those two questions, any of your feedback would be really helpful. Chelsea, I think we can hear you now. Yes. Um, yeah, we like for our St. Paul 350 group, we are really interested in locally produced energy because in this um, like in the climate crisis, people want to know what we can do and what uh, what changes we have control over. And it's it's hard to know. Like right now, I know that some percentage of my of the electricity I use is coming from coal power, and there's nothing I can do about that. And so the idea that we are in control of our energy and um, we know where it comes from. We know um, 
we have that resilience of local locally produced power. It's more efficient when it's when it's produced on site. It's very efficient, and it's not lost over giant power lines. Um, it's just a sense that we are taking control of our energy and and that those resources um, in a way that's more sustainable and more resilient and more democratic when it's community owned. And we know democracy is kind of a um, kind of in trouble right now, too. Thank, thank you for that, Chelsea. Very helpful. Others? Yeah, um, it's, Community generated electricity. I mean, to, to, for a community to have, it's it's truly the the statement of sustainability. If you can produce your own energy, you can control your. You have a little more control over influxes in the future of of your own heating and cooling prices. Your 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 well being. The the sustainability of the long haul of ownership uh, or of of living in that community, and having that control. Uh, gives a little more ease, a little more uh, uh, independence for for uh, you know a community like this. And adding the job component uh, that you were talking about, Monty, I um, I have to agree. That, that, uh, is, is there anything set up where like teasers that were that are being uh, positioned as far as letting folks know about uh, about moving forward with something like that, like? When we first started talking to Michael and Jamez, uh, their first proposal was to come out and start training people. This was maybe like six months ago, and uh, they were ready to start recruiting people and training people for solar rooftop certification okay. installations at Hillcrest. And I had to I had to pump the brakes on them and say, guys, we're not going to have buildings out here for like two or three years. So <laughs> hang, hang, hang back a little bit. I said, but we really could use Michael. I've known as a leader in this industry for many, many years. Uh, Jamez, I've, I've got to know more recently, and we really could use their expertise in helping us develop a robust workforce training program around not just solar rooftop, but around the EV stuff, the, the, the charging, the car share, uh the district energy system we talked about um so we really would like to to see a local recruitment effort here um port authority has been involved in workforce development and customized job training for decades now um and so this is kind of returning to our roots we haven't done something exactly like this for a little while um but we've asked them to uh get under contract with us for the next six months to figure out the program sure we'll get around to training people uh when we can see the rooftop yeah. Getting ready. <laughs> I think John and then Keeley might also have comments. Yes, uh, this the solar cells on top of the buildings. Um, I, I'm not clear on on who's going to own those. So the what we will be asking of the marketplace, uh, businesses such as yourself. Um, you, in order to buy land from us, uh, you will, you know, your the, the real estate marketplace will get a marketing brochure that says requirements or something like that. Um, maximize rooftop solar, uh, net metered rooftop solar port authority to provide turnkey property assessed clean energy financing, um, cash flow positive, uh, financing is what paces is, is how we refer to it which should alleviate some concerns of business owners. But generally, these would be net metered rooftop systems owned by that building owner. Uh, we know that's a path to success because we've done $300 million of pace and, and energy efficiency and solar financing all over the state. Uh, and so we, we know it works. We know the business community, once they figure it out, once they understand it, can embrace it and has embraced it. Um, and there, the idea of a community solar garden or ground mounted solar those might be opportunities for other ownership structures, but it's pretty clear we need to maximize every rooftop and we've got to provide a business case for these building owners as to why they would do that if they're not otherwise inclined to. And we've had, you know, 10 years of practice, so I, I think we can get them there. Yeah, so okay. Yeah, and uh, who's the point person on that to talk to? Have, having uh, solar on my building and and uh, getting checks from the power company for half of the year, 
and and live living with it and and learning a lot about it who can i talk to because there's some subtleties that i think i could add some value uh the, on the finance Lady, side pete klein is the guy yeah. in our office um if it's more about the technology or engineering side uh ips uh impact power systems is uh under contract with us to help us figure this out as well so we could connect you with the financial folks or the technical folks, whoever you'd like, John. I think Russ yeah. hand up. Well, Ke Keely was first. Oh. I want to do a quick time check. We have yeah. four oh minutes left. Um, I think that we, um, Monty, Tiffany, and I will reconnect after at 3.30 about uh, ideas for homework. I think that these are great conversations and we might suggest continuing if you have other ideas about on-site solar or resilience priorities. Um, that is a potential homework, so we'll send something out related to that. Um, we'll make sure to get through the other lead credits um, and then talk about what's not maybe covered in lead at our next meeting. Um, but I think, Monty, do you have any other closing thoughts or do you want to kind of try to hit Keeley, Russ, and Chelsea in the last three minutes? Um, let's let's try and get their uh, comments in, in the last three minutes here and we'll follow up with you guys. Thank you all for the robust conversation. Keely. Uh, yeah, I just get, I guess just quickly to answer that question, how important is it to produce 100% of the community's energy needs on site? I agree with a lot of what Chelsea said of um, it is it is empowering to folks and it is empowering to a community to have that knowledge that there's energy generation on site and to be able to see that that really creates, I think, a culture of sustainability within a community and also lets people know about their own energy usage that it's coming from somewhere so much of our systems now are conducted off-site you know all of my wastewater is taken my water comes from somewhere you know people are really disconnected from all of these systems so seeing that um, on-site and having that knowledge I think really helps um, even like personally people make decisions of how they're using their energy too um, and then additionally it also contributes to that resilience aspect. Having distributed energy systems is gonna be more and more important. Um, we had that thunderstorm in December and there was like lightning all over and my power got taken out um, on my street block. So the more we have you know, storms and different things going on, different stressors to our system, the more important it'll be to have distributed energy systems and having some of that need met on site, I think is super important for that. Keely, thank you so much for that. Um, the Federal Department of Energy we've been talking to, and they are very interested in this concept of distributed energy resources, DER, uh, that are combined under what's called a virtual power plant, a VPP. Um, and they're they're pretty tantalized that we could try something like that here. I, I frankly don't know if and how it will work. We're very early in those discussions with DOE, but you are talking about the future here, Keeley, right on. Um, who uh, do we have left here? Becky, sorry, I lost track. It looks like Russ maybe is covered in the comments. Chelsea, did you have a closing thought? OK, I think we can close out, Monty. Awesome. Thank you all so much for your time. Uh, if you have questions uh, about or want to attend the uh, Planning Commission public hearing next Friday morning, reach out to me directly. Again, my cell number 651-338-1039, 651-338-1039, or you can always shoot me an email, um, but uh, texting me is always a real good way to get a hold of me. Have a great weekend, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Ready to stop the recording? Oh, thank you very much.